This video is going to cover the simple retention model for estimating lifetime value. Before I get into the simple retention model, I want to review a couple concepts from finance with you that we're going to be needing. The first concept is present value. Let's say I invest PB dollars with some interest rate. So for example, I could have $100 today and I put that in the bank and let's say I could get 10% interest on that $100. If we waited T years, this investment of $100 will have some future value. So for example, if I put $100 in today and I wait a year and there's 10% interest, I have $110 in one year. We would say that is the future value of this money. If I wait two years, it's worth, well, 1.1 squared, so that's 1.21 times 100, $121 would be the future value of $100 today. Now remember the definition of lifetime value. Lifetime value is, it's the present value of future cash flows due to the relationship. So if Netflix acquires me as a customer, in a year they're gonna get a payment from me of a certain amount, but that payment, say it's $15, is not worth $15 to them today. So we will, we're interested in the present value of this payment that I'm gonna make, say, a year from now, uh, which would be the $15 a year from now. So all we do is we solve this for the present value, and now we know what the present value of some payment happening T periods out in the future. Another concept that we're going to need is an annuity. So an annuity is simply some series of equal payments over some number of periods. In finance, we usually assume that the first payment occurs at time period one. So for example, maybe I build a factory and I spend a bunch of money today to, to, to have that factory Every month, I'm going to receive some revenues because I have that factory, and we usually assume the first payment occurs at time period one. This term annuity also gets used in investing, where I could buy a financial product called an annuity. So if I retire tomorrow, uh, maybe I wanna have a certain amount of money to live on each month for the next 15 years. Well, what does it cost for me today to have the promise of some payment every month for the next 15 years? That's what an annuity is. Well, let's write out the value of this annuity. So PB at T is going to be the present value of T payments of size M into the future. So if we think about the present value of well, I get one payment at time period one, so we discount that one period. I get another payment at time period two, another payment at time period three, all the way uh, through t, t months out. And so what I have here is a geometric series. So if you remember from calculus, uh, the way it was written in calculus was probably something like this. S sub t is gonna be uh, a, plus a r to the one plus a r squared plus all the way through a r to the t minus one. And so that is a geometric series. In my case, um, the a, I'm, I'm using the not notation that's used pretty universally in calculus books. This is m and the r is gonna be one over one plus the discount rate. So that's what the r is. So how could I find this sum in closed form? Well, back in calculus, what you probably learned was you multiply both sides by this, by one over one plus D. Then if you subtract the second equation from the first equation and solve, you end up with a closed form expression for the value of T payments of size M where you get one of those payments each month for the next T months. 
Now, when we have customer databases, the first payment usually doesn't come at time period one. It comes at time period zero. So Netflix isn't going to give me uh, access to their movies and TV shows until I give, give them some money. So whenever the first payment comes at time period zero, we're going to call that an immediate annuity as opposed to an ordinary annuity. Here is the formula that you get for an immediate annuity. Well, let's see how these concepts apply to customer relationships. The business situation that I'm going to assume is that customers will become members or subscribers, whatever we want to call them, and they're going to give us a periodical fee each month until they decide to cancel. So the canonical example could be something like Netflix, where I subscribe to Netflix, I send them $15 a month until I decide to cancel my membership. The simplest case is what I'm going to call the customer annuity model. And this is where customers are never allowed to cancel. So for example, there could be something like a book of the month club where I agree to buy one book for the next 12 months, each of those books, say, cost $20, so I send you $20, you send me a book, and I am not allowed to not buy the book until the end of my contract. And so, in this case, uh, the contract is for 12 books. Then the question is, what is the value of that relationship? You're gonna get 12 payments of size $20 from me, you're going to deduct the cost of goods sold from that. So maybe the book costs you $10 to print and, and ship to me and all that. Uh, in which case, you're really getting $10 from me each month for the next 12 months. And my lifetime value is simply going to be the present value of 12 payments of size $10. The simplest case, though, is not very realistic. What's much more realistic is what we're going to call the simple retention model. So under the simple retention model, cancellation is allowed. And I'm going to go over to the document camera and kind of derive this live because I think it's uh, probably more interesting that way. Let's say that R is equal to the probability that a customer is retained, period T, pardon me. Now, notice there is no subscript. So note, no subscript. And what that means is the uh, retention rate is constant across all time periods and all customers. So you might think that this uh, is a little bit unrealistic because not all customers may have the, re the same retention rate. Some customers may be inherently more loyal than others. We're going to deal with that when we get to the next model, which is the general retention model, and we're going to add some subscripts here. Likewise, I'm going to say let R sub T equal the event that a customer is retained in period t. So in other words, the probability of r sub t is equal to r. It doesn't matter what month it is, uh, the probability that I'm retained is just r. We're going to assume r sub t is independent of r sub t prime uh, for all t not equal to t prime. So there's independence across time periods. Let's say that we have a random variable, big T, which is equal to the time of cancellation. Now, you can also think of this as the number of payments. So let's just go draw my little um, 
uh, time plot here. So this is time zero, time one, time two, time three. And let's say I have a customer who joins and makes a payment here. So an arrow means you get money from me. And then they decide to stay around in period one. They stay around in period two. And then they cancel sometime in this third period. So this is period one, this is period two, this is period three. So this is the length of time that that customer is around. We would say that t is equal to three here because the customer is canceling in period three. What that also implies is that customer has made three payments. So this, this random variable t is going to be a, a, a rough way to think about lifetime value because it's the number of payments, it's just that we haven't bothered to discount yet. So what's the distribution of t? If you had a really good course in probability theory as an undergraduate, you'll recognize that what I've just laid out are the assumptions for something called a geometric distribution. So the way to think about a geometric distribution is that every period, the customer flips a coin. So the probability of a head is r, the probability of a tail is one minus r, and we're gonna flip the coin until we get a tail. And so in this case, the customer flips the coin, uh, heads I stay, heads I stay, tails I go. And so the geometric distribution just tells us how many times do you have to flip the coin until you get a tail where the probability of a head is r. So let's go work out the probability mass function for this. What's the probability that t is equal to one? Well, that's very easy. This is just the probability that I don't retain you in period one. And this is, is one minus r. So one minus the retention rate is the probability that um, you lose me in the first month of the relationship. Well, what's the probability that you lose me in period two? So let's think about what has to happen for that. You have to, I have to flip the coin once and get a head. Then I have to flip the coin again and get a tail. So you can think of this as you have to retain me in period one and you have to lose me in period two. How do I find that? Well, this is where I'm going to invoke the assumption of independence that I made. This is gonna be the probability that you retain me in period one times the probability that you lose me in period two. So this is equal to r times one minus r. So I'll do one more before I write out the general formula. So what's the probability that you lose me in period three, which is what I just described here? Well, clearly you have to retain me. So I flip the coin once, I get a head. I flip it again, I get a head. And then you lose me and it comes up tails. So we can think of this as the probability of R1 times the probability of R2 times the probability of not R3. So this is going to be R squared times 1 minus R. In general, the probability that you lose me in some period, little t, is going to be R, and you have to, hold, you have to keep me t minus 1 periods. So r to the t minus 1 times 1 minus r. And that gives us the PMF of what's called a geometric random variable. Now, when you study probability theory, one of the first things you do is consider the moments. So what is the expected value of t? In other words, how many periods do I expect to keep a customer? Or equivalently, how many payments do I expect to derive from that relationship? So remember, by definition, this is equal to the sum from t equals one to infinity of t times the probability that t is equal to t. So we could go fill this in 
and do a little bit of algebra and show that this is equal to 1 over 1 minus the retention rate. So that would take a little bit of algebra. I've also given the formula for the variance, and I'm not going to write that out. So E at T is kind of a, a rough way to think about lifetime value, but it doesn't have the discounting. How can we get the discounting in there? In order to get the discounting in, I want to remind you of another result in probability theory. So let's say that g at t is some function of random variable t. So in our case, g at t is going to be pv at t. So that's, think, think that. The expected value of g at t, by definition, is this. We're just going to sum t equals 1 to infinity g at t, that's a, that's a little t, times the probability that t is equal to t. So it looks just like my previous formula, except that I'm evaluating this, this function g at t. Now, if you do the math, this works out to m times r over 1 plus d minus r. So if you're interested in the derivation, I've actually worked it out for you here, where I've dropped in the PMF, I've dropped in the formula for the annuity that, I, that we derived a couple pages ago. You go through the algebra and you end up with that formula. What's probably more common is the immediate situation. And so if you add a payment at time zero that you don't have to discount, do find a common denominator, combine the terms, you get a slightly different formula for uh, the lifetime value of a customer where the first payment comes at time zero. Let's go through a simple example. So suppose that the monthly cash flow is $10. And let's just keep our life really simple and say that uh, the payments come at the end of the month. I'm going to assume a monthly discount rate of 1%. Let's go find the expected lifetime value for different retention rates. So if I have a retention rate of 90%, the expected time of cancellation is going to be 1 over 1 minus 0.9, which is 10. Now, if I could increase the retention rate to, say, 95%, the expected time of cancellation is going to be 1 over 1 minus 0.95, which is 20 periods. So notice the expected number of payments doubles if you go from a retention rate of 0.9 to 0.95. If I had a retention rate of 98%, I expect 50 payments. If I have a 99% retention rate, I expect 100 payments. The point I'm trying to make here is this expected value of t is very sensitive when R is close to 1. So you, you, you actually approach an asymptote at the value of 1. So we can go draw this. So let's say that this is my retention rate. This is 1 over 1 minus R, which we can think of as the expected value of T. And of course, we approach an asymptote at 1. So if I keep a customer every period, with probability one, then I expect that customer to be around an infinite amount of time. Now, this customer does not have infinite lifetime value because a payment that I get from that customer, say a million years from now, has practically no value to me. So as long as the discount rate is greater than one, uh, eventually those payments are gonna be negligible. We can think about e, e at CLV as having this relationship. So here is the value 1 plus d, which is where my asymptote is going to be. This is for the retention rate. So this would be the graph for the expected value of lifetime value. We're going to have an asymptote at 1 plus d, and lifetime value will be some finite number 
for all retention rates less than or equal to one then. So even if I could keep my customers uh, forever, um, the lifetime value would not be infinite. The retention rate, however, increases very quickly with R. So key points here, lifetime value increases nonlinearly with R. Lifetime value, however, increases linearly with M. If you think about it, the expected value of CLV, let's use the immediate formula, is M times 1 plus D over 1 plus D minus R. So we can think of this as a relationship like this. This is going to go through the origin, and it's going to have this value as the slope. So this is really important to understand because if you have a retention rate that's out here somewhere, small changes in the retention rate will produce nonlinear increases in the lifetime value, whereas simply increasing the, the cash flow each month, so if I cross-sell you to more categories, if I upsell you to higher priced items, the effect on lifetime value is linear. Another thing to consider, though, is if my, my, if my retention rates are very poor, so if I have like a 40% retention rate or 50% retention rate, even a large change in the retention rate is not going to affect the lifetime value very much because you're not going to keep the customer that much longer. And you're probably better off focusing in on improving M if you want to increase lifetime value. So we've made some fairly strong assumptions with the simple retention model, and that's why it's called the simple retention model. The assumptions are that these retention rates are constant across all customers and time. But what we're going to see is that not all customers have the same intrinsic level of loyalty. Some customers are just more loyal than others, and their retention rates will, of course, be higher. Likewise, we're going to see that retention rates in practice will vary over time very often that when you have a brand new customer, their retention rates are lower than a customer who has been around for a couple of years. They've already kind of proven their loyalty and your, um, your, your business is part of their, their habit uh, when, when they've been around for a long period of time. So we're going to allow for these things to uh, vary both over customers and time when we get to the next module. I'd like to cover the topic of estimation in this video as well. So where do retention rates come from? In the previous problem, I just assumed different values of the retention rate. But in practice, you acquire a set of customers and you can track them over time. Now, estimation is more difficult because of something called censoring. So censoring is when you don't observe the event of interest, in this case, cancellation, for all the customers. So assume the following situation. Let's say I have acquired N plus M customers. Now N of those customers cancel. M of the customers have not canceled yet and are therefore censored. I, I, I don't know how long those customers uh, will be around. Now let's say that T sub one is the time of cancellation for customer one, T sub two is the time of cancellation for customer two, all the way up through T sub n. C sub one through C sub m are the time of censoring. We can estimate the retention rates using maximum likelihood. So let's go light, write out the likelihood function for each customer who cancels. And so here's that likelihood. Here's the likelihood function for every customer who is censored. Now, the next thing we do is we would take logs of both sides, differentiate this with respect to R, solve for R, and we end up with a formula that looks kind of messy, but it's actually quite intuitive. So this formula says take 1 minus the number of customers who cancel divided by the number of coin flips. So think of the sum of T sub I plus the sum of C sub I as the number of coin flips using the analogy that I had before. So each month a customer flips a coin, heads I stay, tails I go, 
You can think of these C sub i's as customers who flip the coin uh, some number of C sub i times, and it's come up heads each time, so they've, um, they've, they've been retained. So this formula is actually very intuitive. If I gave you a coin and I said, what is the probability of a head? How would you determine the probability of a head? Well, you would flip it a bunch of times, you would count the number of heads, and then divide the number of heads by the number of flips. And that's really all that is happening in this formula. So you can think about n as the number of tails, where a tail is I cancel. One minus the number of tails divided by the number of flips will give me the probability of a head. So let's go look at a tiny example to really understand this. Let's say that little a denotes the period when a customer is, is acquired. So across the top is going to be the month number. So in month five, May, we acquire some customer. The customer flips the coin and decides to stay around in June, flips the coin again in July and decides to stay around, flips the coin in August and decides to cancel. So notice this customer has flipped the coin three times and we've seen one tail, two heads. Likewise, customer two, you'll see, joins in January, cancels in December, and therefore we had 11 flips. Customer three, on the other hand, was acquired the previous December, flips the coin 12 times, and is still around. So really, we flipped the coin and observed 12 heads. So it's very important to account for the fact that this customer has flipped the coin 12 times and we have had 12 heads. If you don't account for those censored customers, you're going to have a downward bias in your estimate of the um, probability of a head. Uh, likewise with customer four, it looks like we flipped the coin five times. So if we look across these eight customers, Notice that there have been five customers who've canceled. So there's been five tails observed. And then we can just total the uh, number of flips by adding up all the C's and the T's. And we end up with a retention rate of, of 92%. We could then use this formula in the lifetime value uh, formulas that I gave you earlier. Let me just summarize the key points that you should take away from this lecture. So first, when you're doing your planning, plan beyond the current purchase. So when you get someone to buy from you, you get the value of that order, but you also get the ability to remarket to them next period and the period after, and that has a long-term value. So the amount that you can spend on an activity is bounded above by how much that activity changes lifetime value. So you can really think of this as ROI, so the return on this investment that you're making. When it comes to estimating lifetime value, so remember lifetime value is not something you can measure. It's only something that you can forecast. You're going to use something called the simple retention model for banger situations. I, sh I should probably explain this banger and looper stuff. There's a very famous poem by um, T.S. Eliot. The, the final line of that poem is, uh, will the uh, universe end in a bang or in a whimper? And so using kind of that same metaphor, uh, we're going to use it for customer relationships. Does the relationship end in a bang where the customer says, it's over, uh, I'm out of here? So think of Netflix or a cable TV subscription. Or does the relationship whimper out, where maybe I used to buy a lot from L.L. Bean, and now I buy less from L.L. Bean, and eventually I will not buy anything from L.L. Bean. So whenever you have a situation where uh, inactivity in a given period doesn't mean the relationship is over, um, you're going to use what's called the migration model. Finally, as a rule of thumb, rule number one is retain your customers. Beyond that, if you want to increase lifetime value, you can do so by increasing revenues, increasing them by cross-selling to other product categories, upselling to higher margin products, or decreasing the costs. And you can decrease either the cost of service 
or the cost of marketing to those customers. 